Welcome to the 24th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Could I ask everybody in the public gallery to switch off their electronic devices or at least switch them to silent so they don't interfere with the work of the committee. Can I welcome James Kelly to the meeting this morning? He is attending in place of Monica Lennon, who's passed on her apologies for not being here today. So welcome, James. And we've also have received apologies from Alex Neal. Item one on the agenda is a decision on taking business in private. Do we agree to take item three in private? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll now take evidence and item two on the Audit Scotland report, principles for a digital future, lessons learned from public sector IT projects. And I welcome the following officials from the Scottish Government, Colin Cook, Director of Digital, Anne Moises, Chief Information Officer, Lisa Barron Broadhurst, Programme Director, Social Security, and Andy McClintock, Chief Digital Officer, Social Security. Now, before I invite an opening statement from the Scottish Government, um, I think I may want to give some, some comments to put this in context, because this is the third report we've received from Audit Scotland in five years. Um, the committee has also considered critical reports about CAP Futures and I6, both of which were major and expensive public sector IT projects that frankly didn't perform satisfactorily um, at all. Um, we don't know the exact cost to the public purse of ICT projects that have not fully delivered, but we know it's likely to have been very substantial. It also appears that the public sector faces greater challenges in delivering ICT programmes compared to the private sector. There have of course been successes without doubt, but we want to be reassured that the Scottish Government and other public bodies have tried to understand fully why previous failures occurred. We also want to be assured that the Scottish Government's new suite of initiatives will actually make the difference this time. So on that basis, can I invite Colin Cook to give his opening comments? Um, thank you, and I, and I do welcome the opportunity to have that um, discussion and talk about the lessons learnt from previous um, IT programs. I, mean, I was appointed to the role of digital director on a permanent basis back in June, having having done the role um, on a on a temporary basis for a few months. And the report has provided a really useful, um, constructive input into our thinking around how we shape up the directorate that I'm now leading, um, the ways of working, the way we measure success, our structures the approach that we need to developing our staff. It also helped inform the Scottish Government's new digital strategy, which we published back in March 2017. Um, and I believe that sets a really important context for today's discussion, but also for the efforts that this country is making to make sure it's a successful digital country in the modern world. In our letter to the committee um, of 25th of August, uh, we set out some of the changes that we're making changing the structure of the directorate so that we can focus the resources we need on assurance, transformation, service design, the opportunities of new and emerging technologies, introducing a new tiered approach to assurance based on challenging standards, improving skills through our new Digital Skills Academy and the Digital Champions Program, which works with leaders of the public sector, new approaches to procurement, including the further development of CivTech, the creation of the Office of the Chief Designer to drive design thinking into the heart of government, and the way in which we work on digital transformation and lead projects with multidisciplinary teams that can reflect upon and learn from the, um, the lessons that come through the Audit Scotland report. I mean, for my part, I believe that a digital country requires a digital government, and I'm determined that I build a team that is truly excellent and gives that leadership. And I do welcome the opportunity to discuss that with you today. Um, in doing so, I'm joined by just a, Anne Moises, who I think many of you know is Scottish Government's Chief Information Officer, who's leading our work on assurance and the new assurance framework that came out of the findings of the Audit Scotland report. And two senior colleagues from Social Security, Lisa Barron Broadhurst, who has overall leadership of the programme, and Andy McClintock, a, a former colleague of ours in the Digital Directorate, who's acting as Chief digital officer of the social security program and I think if, if there are technical questions around how social security is developing we'll be in a great position to answer those so thank you very much. Thank you. First question is to Bill Bowman. Good morning. I um, would like to focus here on the submission of the Scottish Government with the annexes A, B and D which you're familiar with. 
I read um, Annex D, which I think is a social security one, short, brief, to the point, understood that. The A and B um, seems to be full of impressive language, but a bit short on names, dates, numbers. Are you responsible for there being no further IT failures? And if so, can you maybe explain briefly how, how you will do that? And for, for my and part, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes. Thank you for the clarification of the question. Um, I'm responsible for making sure that we implement a robust process of assurance. I'm responsible for ensuring that um, we work with projects wherever they occur across the Scottish Government to pick up problems if they're going to occur early. I'm responsible for ensuring that we have clear standards, clear guidance, that there are training courses available for staff across the Scottish Government to help them lead programmes in a modern and effective way. So yes, in that sense, um, I'm here to improve the way in which the Scottish Government and all the public sector beyond that, working in partnership with local government and health and others, deliver IT programmes. Where have you reached in that process? Well, it's, uh, I mean, it's, I, I, I'm sure you wouldn't expect me to, to say that everything is, is sorted. This is a long-term project. Um, I think we're making good progress. I think we have a good approach to assurance now in place and the work that Anne and her team do, and we've managed to build up that team and increase the resources of it, so I think we're in a good place there. I think we've got the uh, groundwork of good training and support programs in place. I think we've got a number of um, examples of good practice where we have co-located multidisciplinary teams that bring civil servants, policy people, together with delivery people that blend internal and external experience in the right way. So I think we're, we're getting there, and we are certainly improving the way in which we manage IT programs across the government. Some examples of the numbers of people that you have, the teams that you have co-located. I just didn't get a feel from this of where you are and how it's working in practice. I mean, how many people do you have? How many locations are you in? Um, in terms of... Uh, the directorate, the digital directorate, we're around about 450 people, but that covers a range of things. That's not all about the management of IT programs. I mean, for example, we're responsible for the uh, role of Superfast Broadband, and about 250 of those people are working in um, the IT function of the Scottish Government. So we're working to maintain the systems and give civil servants and, and ministers and others the sort of service that they, they need from an IT perspective. Um, in, terms of, um, in terms of doing uh, projects, I'm giving some examples of where we've got co-located teams. So in our own office in Victoria Key, um, we have teams working on transformation activities. So we have um, teams working on um, the development of a common approach to licensing. Now, actually, they're, sorry, they're based out in Glasgow working with SEPA, co-located with SEPA. Um, and we're, we're doing a, a new approach to licensing in SEPA, which is... Um, on the rather glamorous uh, subject of licensing of septic tanks, but it is allowing us to test out a common process for how you approach licensing going forward. We've got um, co-located teams with Social Security, and we'll maybe go on to explore those, but my team is a partner in the Social Security program. We bring technical expertise, we bring delivery expertise into that program, and we're co-located there. So we've got a number of examples of, of co-located teams. Happy to take you through. Well, just, I mean, how many people would be focused on, um, shall we say, preventing future problems? Well, that's the, um, well, <laughs> the Office of the Chief Information Officer, which Anne can, can talk about, um, has around about, well, focused on the assurance process at the moment, we have about seven staff, and we're building that. We've ramped that up consistently over the year. But it's, that's not the only way in which we look to make sure that there are no IT failures. That is an assurance process. So that's going in and assessing. And we, of course, draw on external expertise. So we have a network of people across government who carry out digital first assessments who don't necessarily work in, in my team. In fact, not a majority of them don't. And we draw on experts, ex ex external experts, to do that. Um, the digital transformation team as such, the digital business models team, has about 100 
people in it, and they're working on various programs. So they'd be working on our common approach to information, um, the provision of information, for example, the metrics, some of those projects I talked about earlier, um, you know, working with, working with CEPA, working on licensing, working on social security. So we've got about 100 people in the, uh, what I might class the delivery side of this, um, seven and growing in the assurance side, and then more people working on projects like um, around data, for example. I've got 40 people in that, uh, in that team. So it's a significant investment in staff and resource to get this right. May I ask just one more question? Okay. So from the assurance side, then, have you um, carried out some assurance functions and found something that you have... Um, <laughs> I think I might um, might pass that on to Anne. I mean, the, the, the yes, short the short answer is yes. I mean, we've been embedding um, a two tier assurance process um, for about a year now. Um, a set of digital first standards which set out how projects should be delivered and the the expectations that we have about how users are engaged, about how teams are constructed, about how projects are run, and we've conducted a number of those. Um, exercises. And then we have a specific assurance process for what we regard as high value or high reputational risk projects. And again, Anne's team is responsible for leading those. And uh, I'm sure she'll be able to tell you about some of the, some of the specific examples. Yeah. I can indeed. Um, we've carried out a number of both stop-go assessments, which are major projects. The, those are the ones that are over either 5 million or have a significant risk or reputational value associated with them. Um, and we've also carried out a fair number of um, digital first assessments. I can give you the exact numbers. Um, we did, from the launch, um, which was August last year, we carried out um, 12 digital first assessments, three in the pilot stage, which was quite important because we wanted to ensure that the process was one that that not only added value to us from an assurance perspective, but added value to the projects themselves, that they understood that what we were looking for and that we had a really good view of where they were going to need support should the assessments actually come up with recommendations. So in that particular area, I'm talking about digital first, we work very closely with the um, digital transformation service, which Colin already mentioned, so that should we identify areas where they need more support, for example, user research, or um, an understanding of web or quality, we can actually offer support to go into the teams and they will work with those teams to bring them up to the required standard. Um, since then, we have done another 12 digital first assessments. Um, on the stop goals, which are the, the major ones, um, we, ca we have carried out four currently. Um, those are large projects. Um, Social Security being one of the projects that we've actually carried out a stop go assessment, um, Revenue Scotland, um, National Registers of Scotland, um, and Transport Scotland as well. We have quite a number planned between now and the end of the financial year. Okay. Oh, somebody else. James Kelly has a supplementary. Okay. Um, just on this point about uh, assurance, uh, can I ask, is there a dedicated computer audit team? Not within my. Um, internal OCIO sure. team, no. Um, there is an internal audit team within the Scottish Government um, as part of audit itself, yes. Okay, and are there computer audits carried out uh, in terms of the systems that the Scottish Government are responsible for? Um, what I can tell you is about the systems that I have personally been responsible for in running the IT for the core Scottish Government, and yes, we are subject to regular audits. Yeah, but are they... Uh, are there, uh, what, is there a other dedicated computer audits that take place? I'm not 100%. My point, my, my point is that there's a discussion about assurance, and in order to provide assurance about uh, the, the, the quality in terms of the, the IT systems that are under development and also those that have been implemented, uh, they, I would have expected, you know, when looked at this thing in business, is that th they would normally be subject to regular computer audit to ensure that the processes and procedures that you've got in place are top quality and uh, delivering to the sort of standard we expect. So it doesn't seem to be a computer audit function. So how how is that fulfilled? Well, what my team does 
um, supplemented by external experts um, brought in for particular projects is, is carry out what we call technical assurance, which is effectively an audit but at a, 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 at a point in time in a project. And I'll, I'll be clear, these are projects that are in flight, so they're things that are actually um, in the process of developing or delivering. So if I give you a kind of example, um, the e-counting project, um, which was the one that did the counting of votes for the local authority elections, was one of the ones that we actually piloted the stop-go process on. And for that, we actually ha created a mixed team. We didn't just look at the computer elements. We brought in um, recording officers from local authorities. We brought in people who actually understood the algorithms behind how the counting worked. So we, we determine what the project is, and then we create a team that actually can explore not just the technical bit of it, but how the technical bit of it works in context. So I'm not 100% sure that's exactly the same as a traditional computer audit. It sounds to me as if that that will drill into a particular part of the process mm. rather than uh, having responsibility for uh, a complete overview of the process. Uh, I'm also not convinced that the, the example you've described uh, from a computer audit point of view, you, you would expect a level of independence, and, I, and I'm not sure that, that that's there. The independence is definitely there. My team is entirely separate now from any delivery mechanisms across central government. Um, and as I said, it, it is often supplemented by experts who work at a UK level in very specific topics. So we, we try very hard to make sure that we have... Well, we don't try. We succeed in making sure that the team is independent. Um, and that has the requisite expertise to actually look at the particular project we're involved with. So is there, how is there a, a segregation between your team and the, the teams that you're providing assurance to? Um, how is that independence assured? Well, I mean, I, I, mean, I think Anne's um, cited the fact until, um, uh, until about six months ago, um, that independence was not as clear as we wanted it to be. And as part of the changes that we're introducing, um, we split off responsibility for assurance into a separate function under the OCIO, who now has responsibility for two main things, um, assurance and then the development of staff and capabilities and the professions across the piece. And the operational running of the Scottish Government's computer systems is now um, the responsibility of a new post, which is a Chief Operations Officer, which I think is a better way and more in line with the principles of Audit Scotland of, of going. Okay, okay, I've got points. Okay, I've got a supplementary from Willie Coffey. Hi, thanks. <coughs> thanks very much, Convener. I wonder if I could just ask you a wee bit more about this stop-go process. Effectively, that is an assurance process, but I'd like to get a wee bit more understanding about what exactly it is. What causes something to stop? What happens between stop and go? And what constitutes the, the permission to then go again? It sounds as though that, that is a quality check in place, but could you just explain a wee bit more about what causes that? Is it event-driven? Is it failure-driven? What just, just exactly what causes it to, to enter that process? OK. Um, how we set this up is that we're intervening in projects um, at key points in their development cycle. Um, actually picking up a lot of the key indicators that are in the Audit Scotland report, some of which were previously in our checklist, but that's been supplemented to make sure we've got all of them. Um, so we intervene and on a mandatory basis now. It, it's no longer um, a matter of choice whether projects engage with us. We do um, actually come along and say we are going to have a review at a certain point, um, at key points. So if we take, for example, um, a key point in a project perhaps before they go out to tender to put out a, a requirement to um, to contractors. Um, at that point we would have a assurance team convened who understood the subject matter and what they would do is they'd look at um, pretty much all the indicators that are in the Audit Scotland report of what good looks like. Um, all the checklist material that we have from previous experience, not just in the Scottish Government, but from the UK and from other countries, about the indicators of potential failure. Um, they would go through, um, it's either a three or four day process with um, a number of people on the review team. Um, the project provides us all their background material and we have in-depth interviews with the people who are actually delivering the project. Um, at the end of that, there is a report produced that looks at all the key indicators and the expert assurance team 
gives a view on whether there are areas of risk, and if so, if that risk is such that actually the project should halt until these risks have been mitigated or issues rectified. Um, we haven't put a complete stop on any project in the period since this process has been running, but we have come up with a number of recommendations which the projects have implemented um, really quite quickly um, before they've actually got the momentum back up again. So if, for example, we came up with a really big issue around a, a document that was about to go out to tender, um, our expectation is that they would not issue the document until such times as they had rectified the problems we'd identified. If I'm, if, can I just possibly just add to, to, to that? Because we, we also um, talked about our standards, our digital first standards, and that all um, significant projects are um, subject to those kind of reviews. And that would review the progress of a project at discovery level, alpha and beta in our terms in the life cycle. So the first, um, the first review of whether a project is following standards is in the exploratory phase. It's in the phase when you're finding out about user needs and you're starting to design the process. And I think one of the criticisms that Audit Scotland have made of us in the past is that we, we, we didn't engage early enough in checking that a project was being effectively scoped and that user needs were being effectively understood. So I think, I, I, I think one of the, the really important things about the standards process is that it gets in early and it asks questions about the design of a project, not just the way in which it's being delivered. These are basically system reviews. It's review points. That, that, that is an audit process in itself. Yeah, but who, who would carry that out? Is it people that are slightly out, out with the project scope? or It's always people and, and out who, with the project who are scope. They, are they software engineers? Are they auditors? Just kind of what kind of flavour are I mean, it, are I, these it, it really depends upon the project. Um, we always make sure that there is a, a, a significant technical expertise within that team. Um, but, for example, as I said to you, on, on, in digital first standards, for example, what's really critical is you have people who are expert in understanding customers or the way in which user research or service design is carried on. So they're multidisciplinary teams, um, and they are th the balance of that expertise will be skewed to depending upon the type of project and whereabouts it is in the life cycle. And where we've needed to and we have on occasions, we will bring in external expertise if we think there's a particular issue, maybe that would be around cyber or some um, very detailed technical issue where we need an external expertise, we bring that in as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, Thank I you. wonder whether I could ask a supplementary because I'm, I'm getting increasingly confused as to um, layers of accountability here. So let, let me just be practical. Um, let's say there is a, a problem ultimately, which none of us would wish, with the social security system that, that is being designed. Um, is it Lisa that I would go to? Is she the one accountable? Or is it you, Colin? Um, Lisa is accountable for the delivery of the social security programme, of which IT has a critical part to play. I'm um, a member of the programme board of social security, so I share responsibility for the delivery of Social Security, my specific role on that is to make sure that in the way in which Social Security IT systems are developed and digital systems are developed, they do so as far as possible in line with the um, digital strategy of the Scottish Government. My, I also have uh, people who work for me who are part of that team. Um, ultimately, the accountable officer for Social Security is in the Social Security line. So it's not you? The buck doesn't stop with you, it stops with Lisa? Is that what you're telling me? On a specific issue around the delivery of Social Security, no, 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 the buck I... stops with, with Lisa. On the, the way in which a programme is developed, then we share accountability through the programme board structure for the delivery of that programme. So there isn't one person responsible for the delivery in, in its entirety, both design and delivery? There isn't one person yeah. responsible for this project? Yeah, yes, I'm sorry. So the, that, that's I'm, my what role. I'm... So, as Colin said, his role is to ensure that we have the... Um, materials, the tools, the techniques, the people to support us in that delivery. Um, my ambition would be that we don't hit a problem. We actually um, work together, uh, work with Audit Scotland, work with others and learn lessons so that we actually don't get to a point where we actually have a problem. Um, just to support these guys in terms of what they were saying, we've just been through a um, pre-procurement gate. So we've just awarded a, a contract. Uh, actually, it was, it's going to be awarded officially or it goes live on the 30th. I think we notified you yesterday. But we went through a quite a robust review and it is, um, Mr Coffey, a, a review. 
but it's a really robust review. So on that panel, they had sort of technical IT people, um, people that knew around the digital first standards. Uh, and it was quite a rigorous review. You know what I mean? It's quite challenging in terms of what we were doing, how we were doing things. And it wasn't just, you know, what, uh, what IT or technical things you put in place. It's what governance do you have around that? What, what people do you have in place? What capability do you have? So it's a real sort of robust assessment around that, if that helps. Well, it, it, I, I just like one, I'm very simple, I want one person accountable well, for all IT projects within the Scottish Government, and I'm not hearing that, I'm hearing individual departmental responsibility. Bill? Well, my nearest point to one person would be if you have a stop and go system and a stop is missed, then that comes to you, does it not? If, yeah, yeah, if, basically, if the assurance if, process recommends a stop. Or misses a stop. Or misses a stop. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, the, quality of the, the quality of the IT assurance process it's is my... is a responsibility of the digital directorate and the and the office of the chief information officer within that. Absolutely, the quality of a specific IT program. Um, as a core part of the delivery of a particular programme of the size of Social Security is a matter for the Social Security um, team. But we do everything that we can and we are responsible for challenging and making sure that they follow the best practice um, and that all assurance gates are followed and acted upon. Mm. And we do have the ability, and I think this is come back to this, and that's why they're called Stop Goes. We do have the ability to stop a project if we don't believe that the best practice is being followed. Interesting. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, I'd just like to go back, uh, if I may, uh, particularly Mr Cook. Uh, we heard from the convener's opening remarks that this is the third report, or there have been three reports from Audit Scotland. So do you have oversight as to why previous Audit Scotland reports and the actions taken by the Scottish Government in response haven't prevented further ICT issues? Um, I mean, my job is to make sure that we do learn from those processes, um, and we are, you know, we are we we are we are thoroughly acquainted with all the messages that Audit Scotland put. We work very closely with Audit Scotland to learn from that, and I've started to describe some of the things that I believe best reflect their principles. And I and I. I, th I think, I mean, I know you have a session with Audit Scotland later, but I think we've had a very positive working engagement with that organisation to develop some of those approaches. Um, I, as I said to you, I mean, uh, on a personal level, I came into this job on a permanent basis in June, so I'm uh, not able to really talk with confidence about actions that were taken two or three years ago, but I am able to talk with confidence about what we're doing and how we're learning from it now. It's important you to be able... Uh, I simply put this to you based on the answer, I'm not challenging yeah. you, but oughtn't you to be able to say why things have gone wrong, notwithstanding the previous reports, one would have thought that one of the first jobs you'd have taken would be to look at it and say, right, why when previous recommendations were made, were they not taken on board and or were they not actioned sufficiently to prevent this happening in the future? Yeah, and, and, and that I take as uh, very much the sort of... Um uh, the, the input to, to my thinking about how I need to organise this this function. Um, so as I said to you, I mean we've um, we've made sure there's a clear separation of responsibilities between delivery and assessment. I think that's an important thing. We're increasing the training that's available. We're making sure that we can bring in expert staff from outside the organisation where we need to. We're making um, resources available to projects, to programmes right across the Scottish Government so that they can act as intelligent clients, so that they can find the right people to work in their programmes. I mean, for example, um, a lot of the, the recruitment that's been done in Social Security on the digital side has my team involved in that assessment process because we have the expertise to spot. I hope we have the expertise to spot, We've, including the, the appointment of Andy McClintock here. Um, we have the expertise to identify the kind of talent that we need to deliver. And I think there's a lot of criticism in the past that we got the wrong people in the wrong places, and I think we're trying to deal with, with that. So... The, that audit, all of the reports of Audit Scotland, and particularly the, the, the report that we are um, talking about here today, because that took a really great international look at, um, at, at how we manage IT projects, is completely influencing our thinking and our approach. Uh, I, I may come back to the staffing uh, side of things, the, the talent side of things later on, uh, but the convener also remarked about that, that really this committee is looking for reassurance that this time things will be different. Uh, 
and to some extent, I think you might have answered this, but what specific actions are proposed in the in the new Scottish government submission that haven't been previously tried, that haven't been previously considered, such that this time will be different? Well, I, th I think um, I may explain to you that we've 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 got a new uh, a new structure that we've increased our resources, that we're taking a much firmer role around assurance and as Anne said I mean there was a time when engagement with the chief information officer around assurance was a, a voluntary type process now it's a mandatory process in within Scotland's digital strategy it talks about digital first standards allowing us to stop projects it talks about the assurance process giving stop go um, powers to to this team so we have considerably strengthened the bite that the audit process has um, and I think that's a really really important difference from the past and when I when I took up this job I said that uh, my you know one of my major objectives was to make sure that we had an assurance process with teeth and that's what we're building um, and we're making the resources available to do it and that's not always easy within you know constraints as one can imagine but we have made that call on that commitment because we think that's something that we as a digital directorate can is in a unique position to do. And moving from there to uh, public bodies themselves, uh, in, in previous public audit committees, Scottish Government officials had told uh, the committee members that they'd highlighted an Audit Scotland checklist on IT, ICT to the chief executives of the relevant public bodies. Do you know from your review of what's gone before whether that action resulted in any significant measurable improvements? Yeah. Can I produce a list saying which projects would have failed otherwise? No. Um, do I think it has resulted in measurable improvements? Definitely yes. Um, the checklist was initially, um, and I'm going back to actions taken after the 2012 Audit Scotland report, was initially designed to help um, senior responsible owners ask sensible questions themselves of the projects they're they're actually um, guiding or directing. Um, we changed that um, as our processes have evolved to actually ask for copies of the responses to the checklists so that the Office of the CIO can actually run a quality check over the kinds of responses and pick up any danger signals. The questions that, that the checklist asks are some of the ones that have been highlighted in the latest audit it's called the report as key indicators of potential problems later. So it asks about do you have the right skills in the team who are delivering your project? Uh, if you don't, do you know where to go to? And um, we can pick that up and direct them to the right source of advice and guidance or or actually bodies <coughs> in the ground. Um, it asks about um, the funding arrangements. It asks about the governance arrangements. It, it signposts um, good practice. So, yes, um, quite a number of the the failures that are re really high um, profile, the I6s, the NHS 24s, the, um, the CAP Futures, all those programmes were in train before these assurance processes come into place. Do I think if we'd had some of those then that we could have stopped some of the problems? Potentially, yes. Um, I won't be able to prove that the process works because if it does work, we won't have the problems. Um, so I'm kind of proving a negative. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is that the that you've uh, developed the process, you've developed the assurance, uh, but how will you then ensure that the public bodies themselves uh, also learn those lessons from the previous programmes? One, um, by making the guidance widely available, but actually the most effective way is by going out and talking to the public bodies which we are doing um, as the OCIO has staffed up. We are sending colleagues out and we're starting with the major projects. Um, we're, not, we're not spending an awful lot of time in some of the, the, the under £100,000 at the moment. So we're concentrating on the major projects, but we're actually going out and having engagements with the chief executive, the head of corporate services um, to explain not just that the guidance exists, but why it matters and why it should matter deeply to them. Um, and to create the um, a rapport so that they, they feel comfortable to pick up the phone, ask for advice, um, ask for help, 
or ask for us to assist um, in signposting resources. Right. Uh, just to finish on my section, if you like, um, specifically to the Social Security programme. So what specific steps has the Social Security programme taken to learn lessons from the previous ICT? months so one of the things I'm really keen on is is I'm really big on lessons learned uh, one of the first things I actually did was speak to our audit Scotland colleagues about what they'd done previous reports that had come out um, my team regularly meet uh, and we call meetings every three months uh, and invite people in uh, from other major projects both in public sector and private sector across government not just uh, locally I think we've had 25 different projects in so far um, my view is that in terms of that lessons learned, you can't just learn the lessons and put it on a shelf. Uh, our lessons learned is, is a living document, so we actually catalogue those lessons learned, actually give them an action owner, what are we going to do about it, so lessons that are good, lessons that are bad, and what we're going to do. Certainly the Audit Scotland report was really good for us because we were able to put an action plan in the back of that to make sure that actually we don't fall into any of those traps, you know, we're not going to do big bang, uh, that type of thing. Um, so, you know, we've done a tremendous amount of work uh, on lessons learned, but actually not just lessons learned, what are we going to do about the lessons and how we're going to implement them in particular to social security. Thank you. Okay. Um, Colin Beesey. Thank you, Vera. Um, can I say just at the beginning that uh, this document from the Scottish Government is probably one of the more obscure ones that have come forward uh, in this session of Parliament. Um, I show that what a constituent of mine, if I handed it to him on the street, would say about it. However, let me try and pluck a few bits from it and uh, try and uh, expand knowledge. If you look at, it would have been helpful if these pages have been numbered, but uh, in Annex A, um, item 6, you talk about an IT assurance framework which supports senior responsible owners and accountable officers. Can you give me, an, give me some understanding of the role, particularly of the IT assurance framework, in, in relation to that support role with the senior responsible owners. How do they work together? What do they do? How do they come together? And basically, what can you tell me? The, um, the IT assurance framework is, is the approach that we've been um, describing um, in terms of uh, assessments that are, that are made. Um, and when they where, where they operate the various stages where they operate the things that we we look at and the fact that we share those results and discuss them with the res senior responsible owners and that we have the ability to um, to stop programs I mean one of the one of the key recommendations from Audit Scotland was that all pro projects were seen within an overarching framework of assurance and that's effectively what we've established under the role of the OCIO we've also done it in a very what I hope is a very intelligent way over the first um, few months of its operation in that um, when when the chief information officer when Anne um, gives the findings from an assurance it's not just a sort of tick or no tick it's a it's a set of um, guidance lessons things that you can learn things that you, we expect to improve and of course within my team as I was making the point earlier we have resources that senior responsible officers across the Scottish government and beyond can buy into that, so we actually have somewhere to, for people to go for the expertise they need. So it's not just a question of criticising and leaving it at that. There is a way in which they can access skills to address some of those problems. Do you want to... to um, the reason the assurance framework is intended to support senior responsible owners and accountable officers is because it's not just about technical IT. It's about the entire programme or project. Um, and one of the lessons we have learned in the previous is previous experiences that that you have to make sure that that the entire um, range of the team actually understands what's in their report, and it's critically important that the person leading the programme or project understands what's in the report, what the potential consequences of um, any issues are, and what he or she should be expecting their team to do in the way of remedial action. So it's, it's not a report that just goes to the IT people. It, it's intended for the programme, and it's specifically intended to ensure that the senior responsible owner, the person who's actually res ultimately responsible for that programme, knows what issues there are and knows what's expected. So the senior responsible owner would, in effect, for example, be Lisa in respect to the Social Security 
system. Is that correct? Uh, Stephen Kerr is the uh, senior responsible officer for Social Security. So Stephen has overall responsibility for the delivery of the Social Security programme per se. Lisa is his, his, his programme director. He's, so he's he in charge the of the directorate within which Social Security will sit, and that includes the program to develop the new agency and then the running of that agency after that. Does that make him the accountable officer as well? <laughs> Ultimately, <laughs> Stephen will be the accountable officer for Social Security, but you are, you've got to remember in terms of Social Security, Social Security isn't an IT project. Social Security is about putting a, an agency in place for the people of Scotland with the right processes and procedures that we will IT enable. So the IT is part of that. So it's obviously a big part, an important part, but you know, it, it's not, and I, I'll say it over, you'll probably hear me say it a few times, it's not an IT project, yeah, it's, it's, it's a Social Security agency for Scotland, Example. which will IT enable. Social Security, who's the accountable officer? Stephen Kerr is the senior responsible officer for Social Security. So he Security. is the responsible yes. officer? His, his head will be first on the chopping block, followed by me. So he's the responsible officer, but he's also the accountable officer? Yes. So the two positions actually could be the same? They could be the same. In some organisations, they're not. So a, take a, a, an executive agency, for example, the senior responsible owner might be head of corporate services for a project, whereas the accountable officer would be the chief executive. Is the structure going to work? The structure is working, actually. Mm. Um, the, the reason those two particular terms are included in there is because we're, we're this leads us point again, we're, we're very keen that this isn't seen as just looking at IT in an island that there is no such thing as an IT project. It, the point of doing something that's IT enabled is to actually create a business change or a transformation. And, and that matters to the person who's running the entire programme and it matters to the accountable officer if it's an agency. Um, it, IT contributes and can cause massive problems, but it's only part of the bigger picture for um, an agency chief executive, for example. Mm -hmm. Security and the governance and the accountability will absolutely work. Um, one of the things, again, from the Audit Scotland report is around making sure that accountability is there, making sure that, you know, there's one route way up to the top, which in our case is the programme board. Yeah, in terms of my activities, in terms of social security, all those boards feed through to that one programme board. On that programme board, you'll have Colin there as the representative from the central sort of IT digital function. You'll have commer lead commercial colleagues, lead finance, finance colleagues. So for social security, it all leads to programme board. Big lessons learned from previous programmes that you will know about is when you have groups of people in different areas and I think that might be what you're getting at uh, Mr Beatty in terms of when the accountability sits in different areas for social security the accountability is in one pillar in one mm. tier um, so that all feeds up to one place we will get the independent assurance through uh, the digital centre but actually ultimately that accountability um, leads up to one program board um, so I think for, for Social Security, I'm quite, well, I'm very confident that we've got the right governance structures in with the right levels of accountability in order uh, to I'm deliver I'm glad that. it's so clear. Um, looking at, uh, again, coming back to Stop Go Gates, um, if I look at the, uh, I don't know which, uh, uh, Annex C, no, sorry, that one doesn't work. Ah, if I'm looking at uh, Annex B, 5, 2, is it not a bit of a cop-out, the stop-go gates? Isn't that a way of just pushing uh, decisions up into the lap of the lead minister and ultimately the cabinet secretary for finance and constitution? Because according to this, uh, where a stop-go assessment is made, Accountable officer can only proceed following a, a process requiring lead minister to agree this arrangement with the, with the cabinet secretary for finance and the constitution, who clearly are not IT experts and will be advised by who? By the people who are running the project. So the people that are running the project presumably go to the minister and say, yeah, it's okay to continue. That's the expert advice. Oh, all right then. I mean, what, what sort of judgment are you expecting the ministers to make for an IT project? Surely that's the responsibility of the civil service to deliver. Well, the civil service will make a recommendation to the minister, but I actually think this, and this is one of the ways in and which... And this will be the same people doing well, the assessments. 
it will be a, it'll be a, the minister will be able to sit, will be given the assessment that's been made um, and the recommendations that have come from from Anne's team in particular around that assessment. Um, the judgment on whether to proceed is a judgment that will be taken in a in a, in a broader context um, and uh, I think that's right and proper that it should be taken at the highest possible level in, in, in cases of you know huge public interest. I think what's important, and this again is a reflection of some of the lessons from, from um, Audit Scotland, is that by going through that process, by making sure that the lessons from an audit are, um, are seen at the highest level, there can be no suggestion that, that decisions are not being taken in an open and transparent way. And I think, it's, I think one of the things we learnt from um, some of the Audit Scotland reports was that just, you know, decisions needed to be escalated, the right level of focus needed to be brought at those at the right time. And this is very much part of that process. This means that every stop go, this is the way I read it, every stop go will end up with the accountable officer going to the lead minister, who then has to go to the cabinet secretary. No, that's, that's how I read only, this. Only, only a stop. Only a uh, stop that's, that the programme disagrees with. The expectation would be that if um, the assurance team come up with a stop, it will be evidenced, and that under most circumstances, the programme team will recognise why there is a major issue mm and what it is they should do before they restart the programme. We have recognised that there may be circumstances for a variety of reasons, um, payment deadlines, all sorts of things, that the programme team does not agree with the assessment from the independent review team, and that decides, despite the fact that we've recommended that they stop, they need to continue. That is the only circumstance where it would be escalated. But that's not what it says here. It says here, where a stop-go assessment is made, an accountable officer could only proceed following a transparent process requiring the lead minister to agree this arrangement with the Cabinet Secretary of Finance and Constitution. I, I, in, in which case, I, I apologise for the, for the, um, for for the language. It's where a stop-go assessment has decided that there should be a stop, that the, um, and uh, we will clarify that. I've taken um, a lesson from today's um, discussions already that... Uh, we need to look at the internal marketing, if you like, of the process of assurance to make sure that everybody um, is clear about what it what it constitutes and how it operates, and if there's any obfuscation around that. And I apologise if we've created a difficult way of understanding it in this uh, in this particular letter. We'll make sure that it, when we come, well, as we communicate it across the Scottish government, it is done in a in a very straightforward way that everybody, be they IT experts or non-IT experts, can understand the implications for themselves. And if it's easier to put it into basic language, for example, as Programme Director of Social Security, if I got a red stop, yeah, you, you, you would be a really, it would be really unusual for a Programme Director to insist that that carried on going without taking the actions that came out of those recommendations. You'd really be looking at what, what, why have I got to stop? What am I going to do? What are the actions that I need to do to mitigate that? It would be really unusual to, in, to, to go forward at risk. You know what I mean? Because really it would be at risk because you've got a stop gate. So why would you therefore then be trying to convince a minister that that's the right thing to do? So you'd be looking at what actions you need to take to b get you back on track, do those actions, make sure you've got the action plan in place, and then proceed. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure there is no doubt about this, but the reason that the um, Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Constitution is cited in this process is from a, a digital point of view, he is the minister to whom we report on issues around digital public services. So you, this would be a scenario in which the, the, the civil servants working for the, the Cabinet Secretary for the Finance and Constitution have made a recommendation to stop a project in an area where a a colleague of the minister is responsible for the delivery of the programme, and we think it's right and proper that both ministers are involved in agreeing a way forward in that scenario. OK, just let me pick out another bit. Um, on Annex B, item one, second bullet point, this is a question of recruitment for talent to lead the largest programmes, for example, Social Security, increased support for the accountable office and SRO mm. and so on. What's the success rate in that recruitment been? Um, I mean, recruitment is always and continues to be very challenging. Um, I'm, I'm, I feel very awkward about 
giving you a view on the success rate of uh, recruitment to uh, uh, high-profile digital jobs within Social Security because this is sitting next to me, um, and we managed to find a you know a candidate of, of suitable uh, qualifications to do that. It's but there's no quantification of success. Um, I mean, we are we we. We are finding it difficult to, f to attract the talent that we need in senior levels within IT programs. This is a, this is a problem within, um, well, uh, to be honest, it's a problem across quite a lot of the country and in different sectors of the economy, not only the public sector, because there's a shortage of high quality IT people. Um, um, the, what is the percentage gap? For example, if you need 10 people to do a particular job and you've oh. only got five or six, I mean, it, it, it's not really possible to quant quantify it in that way. What we're talking in, in specific here is, is at the top level. No, maybe um, we can do it that for Social Security. So I think, Andy, you're probably the best place to answer that. Yeah, yeah so we're currently in, a, in the process of, of recruiting uh, a number of IT personnel. Um, so our current head, headline numbers at the moment, we're heading to a recruitment level of 68 people. We have 15 people in post. We had a further 10 scheduled to come on stream by the end of, the, end of December. It's not easy to recruit uh, talent, as Colin has, has referenced already. So we're taking a multi-channeled approach in terms of where we actually look into the market, and that's a mixture of looking within the civil service, across government departments, and indeed the private sector, through external adverts, and in necessary some interim replacements and interim resource contracts to, to fill those gaps. Uh, the skills that are needed are in huge demand, not just in Scotland, but across, across the UK. And, and if it's on salary alone, we will always struggle to compete with the private sector, because in, in numerical terms, there is often a, a wide disparity. Uh, early indications so far is that whilst our, our results haven't been as great as what we would have expected, we're no different to anybody else, but we are seeing the programme has been an attractive opp opportunity for a number of ICT professionals who want to come and join a programme that's got a four-year plus life expectancy. Um, that in itself is an attraction to staff, um, and we're, we're seeing a good response rate. Often the response rate doesn't, doesn't transfer into permanent persons, people who actually make it through the process because uh, they, don't, they don't actually have the attributes or don't display the attributes at the final stage of the interview. But at the moment, we're using a combined approach to resource what we need. We will use the supplier market as, as, as we go through our procurement process. They will bring supplier expertise to the table. But we also have to be mindful of the legacy. So we can, if we overstaff this program in, in, in permanent people, when we get over the hump of the program, we will have a surplus of staff potentially, so we have to be mindful of the legacy we will leave in years to come. So we're striking a balance by making sure that we get the right people in post along the journey at the right points in the programme as the technology starts to develop. Just, just one last point. Uh, we've highlighted the difficulties of recruiting specific talent into the IT side. Um, Annex C, um, last paragraph on the first page, you say... In total, 58 assessors have been recruited and trained to carry out assessments. Well, there doesn't seem to be any problem in getting assessors, does there? Does that mean uh, actually it's 58 extra bodies? Uh, and who trained them? That, that's, uh, trained I mean, them? Anne, can, um, <coughs> Anne, can, Anne can talk about that, but this is, this is a reference to the way in which we carry out digital first assessments, and that is done by um, peers. That is done by a group of IT and other experts within the Scottish Government. So what we do is train them in the process of assessment and um, draw upon their expertise in a particular field as part of that assessment. And that's so to. in all 58 cases? Yes. Yes. So there's no additional cost, if you like? Other than the notional cost. Other than the notional cost, No, yes. and the, obviously and the opportunity cost yeah. of... Uh, uh, the, the training cost, that was the only <coughs> other, other so cost. Who did the training? We got colleagues from the Government Digital Service down south who run, who have been running a very similar process for some time to come up and uh, train our assessors. Was there a cost to that? Um, actually, no, because they were very good and they did it for free. Oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so did I. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, James Kelly had a supplementary. Okay, uh, just following up on one of Colin Beatty's earlier points about the assurance process and the reports that were carried out once you, uh, once you did a, an, an assurance task, and I think you said they went to the, the programme director uh, and they flagged up any issues. How is that formatted in the sense of how does it identify what the issues are Who's responsible for addressing the issue, and what is the time scale for uh, getting the getting the issue resolved? What our report does is identify the issue. It doesn't say 
who in the team is responsible for actually actioning it. That's why it goes to the senior responsible owner, the programme director. The next step is what we ask for back is um, an action plan to address all those issues. And the action plan is the responsibility normally of the programme director to pull together and would identify the issues, who's actually been tasked with delivering them, and would give us a timescale for when the um, delivery would be completed. Our report does say whether things are immediate, um, whether they're critical, that they have to be done before the programme progresses, but the actual programme director would give us a very detailed response. Um, we then follow up on that to ensure that the actions have actually been carried out. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, convener. Yes, just a matter arising, I was interested in Colin Beattie's question on the uh, recruitment. Uh, just uh, the, the Scottish Government has noted throughout its document that there, there are difficulties recruiting and retraining. Uh, and this committee certainly investigated that in quite some depth before. Are you able to give us any idea as to the reason for why it's so difficult to recruit and retain? Is this to do with pay scales, a competition from the private sector such that you can't buy talent? Is it because the talent pool's too small at present? What's going on? And the easy answer is to say all of the above. Um, I mean, just, just before I answer the, the question, I think it's worth noting that in terms of retention, we actually outperform the market. And I think that's um, uh, very much a function of some of that enthusiasm that Andy was describing for the type of work that we're doing. And from a digital point of view, the ability to work on a program and a project that has a direct effect on people's lives is a very attractive proposition for people in a competitive market um, because... You know, it's, it's a real feather in the cap to have worked on something that is of national importance. So that retention, I, th I think we, we do outperform the market. In terms of recruitment difficulties, we don't pay um, at the same level, um, either in basic salary or in bonuses, than some of the large financial institutions in this area. Um, so we, that we are at a, a slight competitive disadvantage there. There is a limited pool of certain skills within the Scottish and indeed UK market. Most um, a majority of businesses, particularly digital businesses, will report similar difficulties in recruiting the talent that they have. Um, there are things that we need to do in order to improve the process of recruitment. And we're, very, we're working very hard with um, our HR colleagues about making it a, a slicker and faster process of recruitment to onboard people. Because if you're in a competitive market, you know, it, 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 you need to be as quick as you possibly can. Make all the robust checks, of course, but be as smooth as you possibly can within the recruitment process and make that pitch, that, that, that excitement, that opportunity to work here in, in a, you know, a clear and coherent way. So there are, there are, there are, <coughs> sorry, there are improvements we can make in the process, but there are, you know, it's a combination of things. Uh, but that begs a question, and I'll, I'll throw this out as a hypothetical. Uh, in terms of the pay, yeah. it, could there be an argument structured that, that's a f that there's a false economy going on here insofar as if you are unable to pay for the best talent yeah. and that has a causal effect down the line on the output, uh, that actually there's a false economy? Uh, and the... the other question begged is around the development of talent. So I, I noticed there are references to the Digital Academy, which presumably has a, a time period before it comes online and before it starts producing. But underneath that, what is being done to develop talent at the earlier levels, primary schools, secondary yeah. schools, the colleges? And there's, there's a huge question there, and I'll, I'll try and, and, and deal with it in, its, in all its component parts, and please forgive me if I, if, if I miss um, one. I mean, you're absolutely right that it is um, absolutely essential for the success of major IT projects that we have the right people with the right skills. That clearly comes through Audit Scotland, and uh, it, it's something we take very, very seriously. If we can't attract people on a permanent basis 
onto the civil service um, terms and conditions to run that. There are other ways in which we do that. We go to the market for contractors. We are developing for Social Security, for example, a, a benching arrangement with, with um, contractors in the private sector so we can draw on talent. We're looking at opportunities um, around um, secondments from major organisations to um, to increase the pool of talent that we can bring to bear on major projects. So that 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 that's that a approach. In terms of um, our approach to training, yes, the Digital Skills Academy is up and running. It's going to be extended and expanded. It's providing really good training on things like um, working in an agile environment, about agile project management. Um, we've had great support in doing that from the Cabinet Office down south and, um, and, and others, and we'll continue to build that. And we've got our own trainers coming on board so that we can expand that function. Um, and that's really vital. We also have a commitment to bringing in new talent into the organization at modern apprentice level and at an entry level. Um, and we will train people in the right ways of developing IT projects. The bigger issue is one that's also you know, very much at the heart of the, the digital strategy. Um, we have um, a, an industry across Scotland, indeed across the UK and, and beyond, where we don't have the talent. We have a number of vacancies, where well, there are many thousands of vacancies in tech industries, and it's forecast to increase. And yes, we need to address that um, right from the beginning throughout the education system, and the Cabinet Secretary is, is very focused on that. Um, the way in which IT is taught in schools, the choices that people, particularly um, young women, make early in their school careers that then put them into a channel where an IT career doesn't appear to be the most obvious route for them. All these things need to be addressed, and they are being addressed within the context of the digital strategy. Thank you. If it helps, what we're trying to do on social security as well is looking at uh, how to be a bit more innovative. So, for example, we've just announced that uh, the corporate centre will be in Dundee, and Dundee is one of the biggest universities that has sort of um, exceptional digital and uh, technology people coming out of it. So we're trying to work with them to see whether there's any of those people coming through those courses or interns and things like that that we can actually bring into the social security programme. The new provider that's coming on, on board uh, to help us with the low income benefits, um, their corporate contribution is to actually go back into the schools and talk to the schools about um, IT jobs, technical jobs, and how to get more people into that. Uh, and they've got a commitment to sponsor, I can't remember off the top of my head, but some modern apprentices into the technology um, jobs to support the work as well. So we're trying where possible to be a little bit more innovative as well. And you're presumably, <laughs> forgive me if I may, uh, <laughs> because presumably one of the difficulties, I mean, coming from the northeast and looking at what the oil industry has had to, to, to cope with, presumably if you have a, a dearth of talent, there's a danger that you bring on talent, you bring it in, and then talent is poached. Uh, so, uh, how are you addressing that? So one of the things we've, in, um, in terms of, so, sorry, I keep social no, security no. again, uh, we're quite big on our risks as well. So, we've just had a deep dive on that particular risk around retaining people and keeping mm. people. Um, so, we're in close li liaison with our um, HR colleagues to say, well, what can we do to retain people? And actually, a lot of the um, discussions also uh, focused on, actually, when we're bringing people in, what are we talking to them about their own development and how we might be able to, you know, encourage them into the civil service so that we can have some on-ground people that, you know, are our people of the future, our talent of the future. So we're having sort of those discussions as well to try and, you know, and bring more people in and, and encourage more people to come forward. I, I, I do think it's worth, uh, worth saying, however, that in one sense, we're not scared of that. I said our retention rate rates are, are very good by um, industry standards. But actually, if we want the best talent and we want people to recognise that a role in digital government is a good thing for their career, we really shouldn't be scared that they might want to take those skills and go elsewhere. I think um, I would love to see people circulating around all industries in, in Scotland and, and contributing to government at a point in their careers. And I'd be very happy with that, particularly on some of the more technical functions, technical architects and cyber expertise. To have that kind of talent pool would be a, a good thing. Um, before I bring in Willie Kofi, can I just ask Mr Cook whether you would provide the committee with um, the number of vacancies you currently have in IT in the same way that Mr McClintock helpfully did for Social Security? You must be able to source a number for us. That would be particularly helpful. Um, and can I just tease out one thing about the role of ministers? Because the Audit Scotland report was quite clear that some of the problems that had arisen in the past were down to legislative 
deadlines. And ministers have control over legislative deadlines in a way that you don't. So if there was a stop notice um, and you reported that to the minister or the cabinet secretary, they, of course, can overrule you in light of legislation. Is that the case? And would we be able to see that? that there would be a transparency yeah. process in decision-making we could follow? The, the, the commitment of the auditing process is that it will be transparent, but it yes. is those kind of circumstances where we think it's right and proper for the, the ministers responsible to, to discuss and make, a, uh, make an agreement. Okay, thank you very much. Willie Coffey. Thanks again. <coughs> Convener, I'd like to come back and explore a wee bit more in depth on methodologies and standards and so on, but, but first of all, to pick up a point that was made earlier about whether we're talking about IT per se here or the wider aspect of social security, you, you must be aware that the estimated cost for the IT component of the social security transfer of powers is £190 million, pounds, which is more than half of the entire transformational cost of those powers to the, the Scottish Parliament. So you, I think you have to forgive the committee members for focusing in and honing in on the IT aspects, given where we've come from. So I think it's important to, to make that point. But could I start off asking you a wee bit more about this digital first service standard? Uh, where did it come from? When did it arise? When is it is it in place now? And why was something like that perhaps not in place before? Um, I don't know why it wasn't in place before. We introduced the digital first standards um, originally about a year ago. It's just coming to um, a, a year's work. We. It is built upon and reflects best practice from um, UK government's government digital services. Um, it has a very similar feel. It's very closely affected by those standards, and I think that's um, acknowledged um, across the world, actually, um, as you know, a robust, good practice standard for digital programs in government. And you see those standards um, taken up and adjusted in countries such as Canada and Australia, who are also embarking on major projects, uh, programs of digitization. So it's been in post for a year. It looks, as I said, about the way in which you organize a project, the way in which you ensure that the user's at the heart of, of, of the project, some of the controls that you have. Um, we ha have been implementing it for nearly a year. We're now reviewing it. Um, we're, we're taking all the lessons learned about its first year of applications, and then we're going to um, learn those, reboot that, and uh, you know, really expand and extend the way in which we, we implement the digital first standard going forward. But I think this is the right time to assess that we've got it right, and it is working in a Scottish context. And it may be that things like we might simplify it somewhat or reduce a number of the standards uh, where we think there's duplication. It's those kind of things that we're looking at in terms of the review. You, you described it yourself as a sort of peer group review involving a whole range of people with different specialisms. Is it? Is it like an overarching overview? I mean, it's not a quality standard that's externally recognised and certified, isn't it? It's not that. So what, what is it? What do you have in place that will control the project life cycle of a particular piece of software that you might be commissioning? And I'll come to the social security system in a wee minute. So what, what would be controlling that and assuring the quality of that development? Um, I'm not sure I totally understand the question. The, 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 the digital first standards will ensure that the program, that the, uh, uh, an IT project and within that a, a software development is developed in an appropriate way, is tested in an appropriate way, that um, is based upon the needs of its users in an appropriate way, and that it is run and developed in an appropriate way, so it goes through an appropriate, um, you know, there is a clear discovery process, there is a, a, an alpha stage where we test the technology, that we, where we have a private or a public beta, and then we, and it will also ensure that we um, set up projects so they can be continuously improved once they're in a live condition. Um, I don't know if Anne wants to add to that, or whether you're... Um, it's not an externally accredited oh. scheme. Um, it does, as Colin said, build on the experiences of the UK government and is very detailed on 22 specific criteria. Um, the Digital First Standard is, is designed not just to ensure you're, you're doing the project right, but you're kind of doing the right project. Mm. So th there's quite a lot of qualitative as well as quantitative measurement in there, and it does things... Um, in some areas where it refers to external standards. So, for example, on um, accessibility, it refers to the external standard W3C, 
accessibility disability standards. So at key points, it will actually point out to external standards that can be externally validated if necessary. But in general, it's, it's good practice um, within government and it builds on what has happened down in government digital service. Um, I was hoping you wouldn't say that. I don't want to make any political points in this, right? But the UK government itself doesn't have a particularly impressive record in delivering IT projects, and this is not a political point. It's about IT and it's about expertise. So if we're using a standard that is in use elsewhere that doesn't have a great track record, I would be a wee bit concerned. Why don't you, why haven't you considered embracing recognised industry quality management standards for IT projects. Why haven't we done that? We, individual projects yeah. to some extent have. So um, ISO accreditation for some things. What we haven't done is we haven't um, gone out and identified critical key external accreditations that would apply across all projects. Um, we have made it rather a framework. Yeah. What, but why not, if you don't mind me asking, Anna, why not? These are recognised industry models that give assurance, that protect us from cost overruns, that protect us from software that doesn't work. You know, this is what these models are about, so why aren't we deploying them here, at the core and at the heart of what we do? I, but at the risk of being slightly controversial, I have yet to see a standard that guarantees against cost overruns. Um, if I could find one, I would apply it tomorrow. I think, I mean, as I said, the... Um I, I certainly don't want to make a political point. It's, uh, it's written into my job description that I, that I don't. Um, but I do think that the standards, the, the, the digital standards that were developed by Government Digital Service are now, as I said, recognised internationally as good practice in the, in the development of um, digital solutions for government. They allow you, as Anne said, where you need to go in more detail on a particular technical point and make sure that it meets a particular standard where you think that is appropriate, we will bring the expertise to bear to do that. And that's what a lot of the major projects will do. And, and a number of the, the, the reviews that Anne is responsible for bring in external expertise who evaluate against industry standards. So that, op that option does exist and we will be using it if, you know, effectively and, and appropriately. So we, we may be here next year at this time and we may be looking at the implementation of the first module in the social security system, which I think has been estimated now at £8.3 million pounds to, to develop. Where is the assurance process at the heart of that? Is it, is it basically in the hands of the external contractor that's been appointed or is it your team that will provide that assurance? Uh, the, the social security... Um first stage or first module as you, d you described it will be subject that will be classified as a major project um, it is going to be over five million pounds it's also you know in incredibly important to the reputation of of, of government for, for a number of, of reasons so it will be subject to the assurance the major projects assurance process we've attempted to describe and to the digital first standards within that um, and we will be able to put that report and analysis in front of the committee and discuss it in a year's time if if, if, if that's um, what you choose to do. And I'm sure Andy's chomping at the bit to come in here, but as well as obviously the digital first standards, <coughs> which are you know, great principles to work towards, you know, getting down to the bottom line is you know, we have a technical design authority that will be responsible for looking across the piece in terms of you know, the technology and what we're putting in place to support the technology for social security. Uh, on that board, we're just considering bringing some um, non-executives in there into that board to actually give us a bit of external scrutiny, as well as the scrutiny that we get from the centre. I have engaged some contracts to actually give me some external scrutiny as well, so a bit of challenge in terms of what we're doing and how we're doing it. Uh, I'll bring Andy in in a minute because Andy's <coughs> brought some key personnel into his area uh, that have got some specific skills around cyber data and things like that, that I'm sure, you know, work to, to the standards that you're describing, those, you know, um, industry standards, Andy? Okay. Um, I think it would help if I, if I set out the fact that we are a growing team, a growing capability. This £8.3 million pound contract you've referred to um, will be the first deliverable uh, delivered next year. Um, to get to that point, it's been a robust and open and fair procurement process, which you know has, get, has taken us a long time. It's had this stop go gate a long way. It's had significant input from digital colleagues as part of specification. 
I think more importantly, it's had vital input from procurement. Procurement have a, value, a valuable part to play in the whole journey from conception requirements through to award of the contract and actual contract management. As Lisa said, we, I've brought in some expertise uh, from elsewhere in, in, in the UK public sector that has an understanding of programmes of this scale previously, including those in the welfare and, and the benefits, benefits area. So we already have architectural expertise that has seen some of the the um, unfortunate decisions in event of the past have seen where mistakes we made previously and they're helping us to architect a solution and design that is both modular but is also adaptable for the future so if i'm sitting back in front of you next year i hope to have a story to show you what the outputs of that effort and that planning has been along the way so this is more than just, than just talk a lot of the the effort and the foundation that's been done over the last seven or eight months since I've been in post is about getting the right capabilities in and not rushing into an award of a of a piece of work. This 8.3 million pound contract is a small part of a longer term investment. I'm very clear that our long term vision is not for a single supplier to have total control of this program or the, the total solution. I see a multi vendor, a multi solution approach that is both adaptable for the, the benefits of today and what may come for tomorrow but also is able to interchange over the lifetime of the programme and beyond my existence. Ultimately, I, ultimately I, I could actually be one of the consumers of this benefits platform in the future, God forbid. So I want to make sure that whatever I'm instrumental in designing and delivering, I'm a consumer of too. So I have a vested interest from a number of perspectives. It'll be very summer 2019. It's not going to be that long, is it? <laughs> I feel old already. <laughs> but can I come back to the point, if you don't mind me saying that we have been here before, previous committees have been here before, we see a figure that says £8.3 million. Pounds. How robust is that at this stage? Have you, have you got a complete and a full uh, system requirement in place? Has it been signed off, approved by government ministers, by the users, of the, you know, the, there's been user involvement in specifying this? Is that robust or is that going to change as we go? And are you going to come back, Andy, next year and say, well, the specification changed a wee bit again there, and then we had to adapt this and change that, and now it's 16 million. Okay. So, first and foremost, the contract is capped at maximum value, so it can't be exceeded. So that's the first and foremost. Uh, the specification has been uh, taking a long time to get to where it has. It's had multiple inputs from multiple parts of government, including users, users' involvement in terms of the early stages of some of the specification for user design. It's had digital input, it's had OCI input, it's had program input, it's had policy input, and it's had procurement input. So the specification that went to market, in my view, was as robust as it could be. The response from market was, was, was healthy. We got down to a, a short list of suppliers and we finished up with a supplier that's been awarded as a piece of business. Um, I'm confident, as I can be sitting here today, that they have the product, they have the capability, along with our capability, to deliver that solution by next year. The delivery approach won't be the fact that they will come in and deliver it and then hold us hostage to fortune. We are looking for a delivery model where they step back the delivery. So the first stage, they deliver themselves. The second stage, we deliver with them. And then the third stage, we deliver with them standing behind. It's a very stepped model that at least and I have been away and have evidenced elsewhere that the suppliers actually managed to do that previously. So that and a combination of robust commercial skills on the ground, I have a high degree of confidence. Okay, that, that, sounds, that sounds pretty good. Um, and the, the external contractor that, that's doing it, is that there's no in-house software development going on within the Scottish Government. It's completely external, is it? So, um, in, in, in the whole context of, of, of what Colin and Lisa have touched on, this, well, this is an agile programme, so what we do will be done in incremental pieces of work. Yeah, We've, so by the Scottish Government IT team or is it the external contractor so it's, entirely? It's, it's, a com it's a combined approach, combined yeah, delivery right, model. Right. So, yeah. And to, to be clear, we are not developing software. We are taking a off-the-shelf product and we're adapting it. There will be some customizations of that solution and there's some licenses in that contract, but this is not the concept of developing software from scratch. Why is it 8.3 million pounds then? Because there is a combination of elements in that contract over the two two year life cycle, which is a mixture of services, product, licensing, hosting costs in terms of where the, the platform is going to reside. Seems quite a high cost for something that's being adapted. Not really. Not when you, if, if, if I was able to sit here and show you the, the elements and break down the contract, you'd understand why it was 80.3 million. And I think if you looked at it, if, if you actually, actually had a look at it, yeah. I think you, if you looked at what was actually in, in the actual overall contract, you would look at it as a, as a good value proposition for the public sector. Okay, accept that. Yeah, just back to the, the, the point about methodology. So the external contractor, for their point of view, they will apply their own system of controls and checks and quality 
and you know quality management, they will be applying their whatever their standards are for their element that they're developing and testing. Yeah, there's a. There's, they, they won't be applying your digital first standard. They'll be applying theirs. <coughs> we are very clear, and it was part of the, the procurement specification went out that the, the bids that came back had to had to endorse and subscribe to those digital standards. So the bids that we marked back on each of those 22 principles and standards, there was a compliance statement in terms of where they felt that they were either compliant in full or in part. That was a basis of the overall evaluation and criteria. The quality management they apply once they are, are on site will be a blend of their own quality standards and our own approach. That's, what this, that's where the joint delivery team interspersed with a, an agile approach where we're breaking this piece, this delivery into small bite-sized chunks. Uh, you've, you've mentioned the 190 million pound figure already this morning. This represents a proportion of a potential 190 million pound spend. This is not the whole, the whole story. This is a, an incremental investment in the benefits platform for reuse in the future, but not just for the benefits today, but hopefully for the benefits for the future. Okay. And I think, I think we can take confidence from the fact that um, on Social Security and other projects, um, we're already demonstrating how having those blended teams, how having expertise within the government and from a supplier, um, working to the way in which government wants to see digital projects developed, as defined by the Digital First Standards, is changing practice and delivering results. And I think the, the discovery that was um, undertaken to lead to the contract Andy's described is a good example of that, where you know, work was taking place internally and externally, and I think we have a, you know, a, a good result in terms of a specification to go forward with. 8.3 million. Before we get to the point of spending some, any or all, the 8.3 million over the two-year period, all of the pieces of work we've broken down in agile terms into sprints, and each of those sprints is, is a, sp a chunk of work that is very clearly specified with a very clear outcome and a very clear payment at the end of it. So it's not a case of awarding £8.3 million and just paying the cheque. That 8 .3 will be broken down into multiple bite-sized chunks and there will be deliverables along that way. And if anybody around this table thinks I'm going to sit here and write a cheque and pay £8.3 million <laughs> for nothing, not going to happen on my watch. I know a wee bit about Agile and the methodology and the kind of iterative bite-sized chunk thing that you're, you're describing, Andy, but some of the criticisms of Agile are that it lacks evidence in records. Uh, for example, testing records, for example. Shall I go in? Some Shall of the criticisms are about it. So well, could you address? The first thing I was going to address is um, if, if you think we're not putting structures and governance around Agile, uh, you're wrong. So uh, from a program director's point of view, we will still have all those project artifacts that you would normally expect. So you'd expect a robust plan, a business case. Um, uh, so all those sort of pieces of the jigsaw absolutely have to be there. So they'll be measured against that plan. So there's no sort of slippage against timescales. It's a myth that in an agile environment or in an agile world, you don't have a plan for delivery. You absolutely do. No, Lisa, I mean, the software, when it is being tested, yeah. the criticism nope. I've heard of agile, is that it lacks an evidence base and record base to provide any evidence for external audit, for example, from step to step to make sure that the software is working. So, if I could just, if I, you, no. okay. So, the plan for this for this for this particular piece of work is is that, for, for example, around around security and testing, in each and every stage of every piece of the of the software that's 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 introduced or is, is adapted. Security and cyber resilience and prevention of, of, of fraud and, 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 and et, cetera, et, cetera, et cetera is embedded into each of those stages. So we're, we're building security in, in by design. Testing will be done at a unit level. So each piece of work and each piece of sprint work will have an element of testing in it, whether it's development testing, unit testing, live testing. So testing will be incremental, it won't be left until the end when the 8.3 million pound is payable or the last bit of the 8.3 is payable before we realize we have a system that either doesn't work end to end. Things are done. The work is broken down into packages and phases and sprints, but the actual incremental use of that software and the test that software is done in the same approach too. And you, um, from, from my part, part I, you know, I, I understand that the, the use of different project management methodologies is a, is a controversial area. What we ensure, and we reflect this in our standards, that agile methodologies are used where they're appropriate, and that's partic you know, particularly in areas that are new developments, um, but have, please take my assurance that the way in which we will apply agile methodologies is disciplined. It will relate to an overall framework of governance, so there will be a um, good oversight on how projects are developed. And the fact that it allows for frequent inspection and adaption of a product and regular releases of software allows us to have that confidence. So we think it's the right methodology for this particular program. Okay, final point. One, one of the previous uh, serious criticisms of software development projects was 
was the lack of documentation by code writers from step to step, and that was particularly a problem when personnel would change, perhaps, and move on. It was incredibly difficult to fix, repair, maintain software for which there was very little documentation. If you're giving me an assurance that there will be substantial documentation and test records available throughout the phase of the project, I'd, I'd take some great comfort in, in hearing that from you. Okay, I'll re re reflect on what I said earlier. So this is a, a product that, it, that a large part of this 8.3 million is based on a product that already exists, which is well documented. Anything that we do to adapt, modify, or integrate it with other systems will be documented by us, with us, and with the supplier. So it's not a case of having to document every single screen and code from, from the outset because we're not actually building a system from scratch. One of the key attributes in, in considering this bid from the supplier was about the element of reuse. So we actually lowered the risk of the program, enhanced our chances of success of delivery, but also build on, a, on, a, on, the, on the back of a product that has you know, global use. Okay, that's good. Okay, supplementaries okay. from Liam Kerr and then James Kelly. Thank you. Just very briefly, I, it was quite interesting something Willie Coffey was leading on, that the 8.3 million, you say it's an off-the-shelf sh off uh, package. The shelf solution. Right. Uh, and uh, Mr Coffey mentioned that that seems quite a lot of money. It does seem quite a lot of money, to me as well. Um, can you compare, if it's an off-the-shelf solution... Uh, or based on an off-shelf solution, it must have been used before by someone else. So what did they pay for it? I can't, I can't, dis I, I can't share because I don't have the information of what other customers might have paid for the software component of our, of, of our contract. What I can tell you is that I'm satisfied in terms of the public value and the public purse that the end point that we reached in commercial terms was the best possible solution we could have outcome for the Scottish pu public sector. But how certain can you be, just press you on that, how certain Keep can going. you be that you've cut a good deal if you've no idea what the cost of the deal was to, to other users? Most suppliers, in fact, including this supplier, most of suppliers will enter into commercial com confidential agreements with all of their customers, and it will be very, very hard for that confidentiality to be, to be, to be broken. However, it's fair to say that with enough market gathering intelligence and enough discussion amongst the, amongst the supply community, you can get a feel for what the investment cost of software is and where that lands. And I'm convinced, sitting around this table today, and colleagues to my left will, will attest to my scrutiny and my commercial acumen in terms of commercial values, that I'm satisfied that what's, what the price we've landed up, to, up on that contract is the best possible price that we could have secured in the current climate for our requirements and what we need to deliver that software. And how satisfied are you? You talk about the bite size process, so you're not just writing a check up front. Uh, one of the issues that we've looked at before on the I6 project uh, was that there was ambiguity in the contracts. No one knew what was being delivered and who was responsible for the delivery. And then how robust the indemnities were to ensure that if there were cost overruns, that uh, that wouldn't fall on the public purse. So how confident are you? that in your bite-sized process, the contractual documentation is sufficiently robust, and indeed the indemnities are sufficiently robust, that if there's a problem, it doesn't fall on the public purse. Okay, well, first and foremost, as I said already, the contract is capped at a maximum value, so it can't be exceeded. So the contract's been awarded with a maximum co contract spend, so it cannot be exceeded. There is a tolerance in there, but there's, but it's a, there's an overall capped value in the contract. In terms of the indemnities that, that, that sit behind that, I'm not a procurement specialist, but my procurement colleagues who've been with us every step of the way, we have, we have assigned specialist procurement people now embedded in our program, work alongside us. Every step we take with, is, is done with procurement with us hand in hand. And I'm satisfied that the indemnities around public procurements and the framework we've used for that indemnifies us from that. We take it down a level into those bite-sized chunks. Each piece of work will be driven by what's kind of statement of work. That's a statement of work generated by us, agree with the supply in terms of what we're going to get in a sprint over six weeks or six, you know, six weeks or eight week period, what those deliveries are going to be. And in the majority of those, I'd expect them to be fixed price. But irrespective of whether they are fixed price or variable, the maximum value that contract that supplier can get from that contract is capped. And within that, the software cap, the cost of the actual software licenses are fixed and they are locked. Okay, James Kelly. In terms of the uh, 8.3 million, um, does that, uh, what happens about 
uh, IT hardware? Is that separate from that 8.3 million? No, so the platform, the platform this, this solution we're running is going to be cloud-based, again, in, in, in accordance with digital principles, digital standards. So the cost of actually running the platform is within the 8.3 million. So the actual virtual hardware that the software will run on is all within that, as are the annual hosting costs for the two years of the contract. So you're, you're confident that the hardware can be encompassed within the 8.3 million? It's already in the specification. So as part of the bid, the supplier has bid a configuration for the platform to their specifications based on our users, our anticipated volumes, the number of benefits, the number of payments that have to be handled and transacted. That's all architected in the overall solution. So there's a hosting element of that 8.3 million, which accounts for all that in, in, in the cost too. Okay, in terms of the overall cost in the financial memorandum of the £190 million, uh, is there any detail as to how that's been built up? Um, do you want me to answer that? So, um, colleagues who have been before the finance, uh, finance committee before have already touched on how the £190 million has been arrived at, so I'm not going to go over that in, in forensic detail. What I can say is that within the £190 million, pounds, the, the maximum level of optimism and bias in accordance, in accordance with Treasury Green Book standards has been applied. So we are on a journey for a, to deliver a, a, a range of technology and solutions to support the programme and ultimately the agency. And when those figures were put together, they were based on what, we, what is believed is going to be required to get the various technology and solutions to be put in place. This is an incredibly complex and challenging journey going on, and nobody's saying that that is a that is a that is a spot on accurate figure. I think the figure that's been that's been used in there is is, is based as that's an estimate based over four years, um, and that's how that figure has arrived has been has been arrived at. But it has got significant optimism bias built into it, unlike perhaps other programs in the past where optimism bias was was at a much lower level. I've examined the various responses that have gone to the Social Security Committee on this and also the Finance Committee, and I've yet to see any explanation as to how the £190 million has been built up. Does anybody have that information and would be able to provide it to the committee? I can't sit here today and give you a, a fact, fact by fact, line by line, but I'll take an action away to make sure that you're furnished with more, or the committee is furnished with more details that perhaps put some more greater clarity on how the £190 million was calculated. I think finance colleagues before me have, have attempted to answer some of those questions. I thought they'd done so satisfactorily, but clearly not. Well, well just to be clear, I, I'm not looking for a narrative or a description as to how the £190 million has arrived at. I'm actually looking, at ta looking for a table as to how those costs uh, have been built up and what the different component parts are. There, therefore, how the overall figure has been arrived at, because it is in the financial memorandum of uh, a piece of legislation before this parliament. So yes. it's quite important that we're able to back that figure up. Okay. okay. That's great. For, grateful for you for writing to the committee on that point. Bill Bowman. I thank you. I don't think we've um, spoken about future proofing. Y you said that you take a standard product and then you've amended it uh, in, in some way. If the manufacturer comes along with an upgrade, a fix, a patch, an update, how easy or how future-proofed are you when you've then got to start presumably adjusting that to whatever you did in the first place to the product? Okay, so our approach will be to take the product in its most vanilla standard form and, and, and adapt it as, as appropriate to the social security powers for Scotland. In doing so, and with the supplier, we won't take the product into a space where it can't receive routine upgrades and patches without reverse engineering. So our approach will be to make sure the product is used as much as possible out of the box with adaptations and configurations, but the supplier is on the journey with us and we will rely on them to make sure that we do not take the product into a space where it can't be upgraded in the future. Fair enough. Okay, I wonder whether I might draw your attention to paragraph 21 of your submission. Um, and just ask a couple of just kind of questions of, of um, detail. Um, you say data innovation could potentially benefit Scotland by 20 billion. There's a wee asterisk there. I can't find the corresponding asterisk to tell me how you've arrived at this figure. And if I can't find it, maybe you can't either. So um, perhaps I, we should agree I, you I, should I, stop may, looking. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> I, maybe you, you can forgive me and I can write to the committee that, about the... About the uh, I mean, that is an externally generated um, sure. figure and is, is widely used in, in, uh, in many contexts, including the city deals and others. So I, 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 it is uh, it, very it would well be useful But I apologise for the... That's um, okay. 
just shows the lack of read, a footnote. We read exactly what you send to us. So if you could write to us with the, the source and explanation, that would be particularly helpful. You then, in the same paragraph, go on to talk about Scotland has a world-leading set of public data. And then later on, you, you say that this will deliver one billion in public sector efficiencies. Now, if I was the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, I would be jumping all over this figure, um, given, given his current budget problems. It's not a figure I recognise. How is this built up? Where do you get this from? And, and if I could just be a little sharp about this, so far, we have had hundreds of millions of pounds of failure in IT projects. You, you mentioned through yourself NHS 24, Cap Futures, you know, Police Scotland, hundreds of millions of pounds. So I find it really difficult to accept your figure that somehow this is going to create a billion pounds of efficiencies because with respect, that's not this committee's experience to date. I, 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 take, I take the point. I mean, I will, I will cite, I will, I'll go back and reference that figure. It's a, it's a global understanding of how one, could, how one can use data within the sphere of the public sector and the delivery of public services. It would include things like the use of um, predictive analytics in order to, um, you know, predict when particular health and social care circumstances might arise, that kind of, of thing. Um, so it is very much a, a potential figure that's been built up by, um, I believe, independent experts, but I will come back to you on the source of that figure. Not a figure Derek Mackay can say this is going to happen it, in his budget. It is not a figure that Derek Mackay oh. will commit to, I suspect, over the next lifetime of three years, but he is definitely engaged with the process of how we use data okay. in order to deliver efficiencies in the public sector. Good. I, I, I just don't like overclaims, you know, uh, yeah, and uh, so uh, paragraph 21 might, might need some adjusting. Uh, um, anyway, can I ask, uh, any of you IT professionals... Qualified IT professionals. I'm just curious because, you know, Anne is. Yeah. You behave as if you are, Mr. <laughs> McClintock, but, but I, I, I... I'm not sure yes. what you read, in, read into that. Um. I'm not. Okay, okay. It, it's just I'm curious because it's a very technical area and I confess as a layperson, you know, it's very difficult to understand. So that, that must be the case for our, our non-IT professionals as well. It's a very technical area. It's also an area that requires a thorough understanding of user needs. It's an area that really expects you to understand how business processes work okay. um, and an area that you have to bring commercial skills to bear. And I think um, you know, in, in front of you, you have a combination of all of those um, things. And, and right throughout my team, you have a combination of user research, service design, commercial skills and technical skills where it's appropriate. And we've, we've done that quite deliberately. Okay, and your argument is that by restructuring, that's taking care of the, the kind of lack of capacity in the past by by restructuring we've been able to identify where we have gaps okay. and we're now filling those gaps with the people that we need and some of those people will be from within the organization some of those people will be from outside the organization and from a social security program director's perspective that's why i've got a very good chief digital officer indeed um uh, i've been in scottish government for just over 10 years but before that i spent time in, in public sector in health in england and I've spent five years in the commercial sector working for software companies, so I have a good understanding of the mechanics, the software revenue, the software delivery, and all the things that go into software delivery. So I bring a mixture of private and public sector skills uh, to the table, and that's why um, I've been selected for uh, this uh, easy job, as they said, they tell me. Excellent, and don't go anywhere very soon. Thank so, you. Um, <laughs> you can, I, can I just stick with the, the kind of expertise and, and people? You've got a group of senior academics providing challenge, advice, all of that. Um, what's their role? Um, that's, a, that's a group that we've set up to um, challenge our approach to the digitization of government, specifically what we, we call the development of digital business models for, for government. So it's people like uh, Mark Thompson from the, the Judge Business School in Cambridge and Alan Brown from, from Surrey. Um, and their role is to really to challenge us, to make sure that we are they, that they look internationally to identify best practice and to challenge that we are following that that practice. Um, and they've done that very successfully. Um, we I think we say in the in the letter that, that we had a, a, a short research project done by some of their their MBA students recently, which has really helped to to position how Scotland is getting on in an international context and has provided a few important pointers for us. Um, and this is very much about you know setting government up and building new parts of government on the basis of digital business models, the way in which you would. 
set up a business in 2017, not a way in which you would have created a department in 1945 or whenever that would have been the case. And I think having that external expertise is indeed helpful. But do any of these academics, insofar as you're aware, work in the private sector or have consultancies at the same time as they're advising you? Uh, yes, I am aware of at least one that has a consultancy or has a role in a consultancy, but we make sure that there is a specific, um, you know, that, that is not, there is no conflict of interest in the way in which we are using that individual. Okay, let, let, let me press you a bit further because mm. obviously if they're sitting around the table with government, yep. at the same time they hold consultancies and are bidding for contracts, whether it's, you know, um, social security or indeed whether they were involved, um, as I understand one of them has been with Accenture, which was of course the failed IT project for Police Scotland. How do you ensure that there is no conflict of interest um, uh, given their involvement to date with Scottish Government IT projects and the potential involvement in the future? I'm not aware of one. I mean, there may well be, and I apologise, I'm not aware of a direct involvement with Accenture as a company. Okay. That wasn't the one I was um, citing. Um, our, where they're, what, what they are employed to do is to look at international best practice and to challenge us about the way in which we are thinking about um, the, the overall formulation of our approach to the development of digital business models. They are not employed to advise upon specific programs of activity, and they are certainly not advised to advise upon a procurement specification for any piece of activity. That is not their remit. They are, they are um, looking internationally, identifying best practice, and challenging us about, uh, you know, about whether we're meeting those kind of standards. They're not dealing with specific projects. Um, how do you check, I'm assuming you do check, the backgrounds of people to ascertain if there's a conflict of interest? Yeah. Have you done it for them all, particularly as um, I now understand from you that these positions are paid? Um, yeah, I mean, th there is a... Th we, we always look out for, for conflict of interest. We would recuse anyone from any um, uh, issue that would, would lead to a contractual award. That is not the the case. I am familiar with, I I'm, I'm apologise, I'm not sure which the Accenture case is. We do look in the, to the backgrounds of people because we want to ensure that we have the best quality advisors. And the two names that I um, cited, I would think under most um, external scrutiny would, be, would appear as the, the, you know, two of the top experts on the digitisation of government in the UK. Um, and we, you know, we respect and take their advice. Sorry, I've got a list of some seven, eight names here right. that, You've that, that gone into, I was um, looking at. From um, including I, the I just think the, the, the issue is where you're talking about multi-million pound contracts in yeah. the public sector that some of these academics may well hold posts in the private sector and you would need to guard against influence. So I'm looking for you to confirm that you have checked the backgrounds of all of these people. As a matter of routine. I, I can confirm that they will have no impact upon... Um, That's not any my question. Them. Well, That, that I, wasn't my question. Okay. Um, I, I know we have looked into the biographies of those people because they've been proposed as experts and we've examined their credentials for being experts. Um, I will make sure, and I will come back to you, that we have all the necessary documentation in place. If we haven't got it already, we will make sure we do to give you that satisfaction. But okay. please accept my assurance that they are not dealing at any level with anything that results in a c direct contractual award, and neither would it be appropriate to do so. No, and I think that, that is very helpful reassurance indeed, and I would welcome that in writing. For the procurement that's just completed, any £8.3 million pound contract, none of Colin's um, uh, specialists or advisors had any part to play in any part of the journey. Okay, that's very helpful to know too. Thank you very much. Any remaining questions from committee members? No, I think you've exhausted us all this morning. Um, can I thank you very much for your evidence and the committee will now move into private session. Thank you.